Hello everyone and welcome to Charting Change in Legal. I'm Caroline Hill. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Legal IT Insider and I'm here with... Ari Kaplan. I'm an analyst that covers legal. I'm not Editor-in-Chief of anything. Gosh, that's such a cool title. It is, and especially as there's only one of me. You know what? I kind of inherited that title uh, and, you know, yeah, and I just kind of maintain it because I like to feel important. Wow. And it's amazing how we always start the show off with the nonsensical banter that has become our brand. So well, <laughs> can we just say, can we just say, so after our last podcast, when we gave a secret code, Ari gave the secret code just to prove that people are listening. Two people have messaged us. We did. Two separate we, I people. Think, I, think, I think there was a third, uh, just to be fair. There was a third. <laughs> and nobody wanted the postcard, although they will get them. <laughs> I think that's that's a key point. We'll have to come up with things that I should, people actually want, but I will be sending a postcard to I one will. of our listeners from Amsterdam, and you're going to be sending one from London. London. And yeah. I'm very excited. I forget. I have to send a third one a postcard too. So we'll uh, we'll figure that out. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about charting change in legal and yeah. how things have been, uh, you know, evolving. <laughs> That's a <laughs> if ever there was a generic handover, right? It's like, let's talk about change. Yeah. yeah. Has there been some has there been any change happening in your world? Like, oh yeah, there's been lots of change. So um, you know, yeah, it's been really changing a lot. Um, so, and we're charting it. So we're and I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm all over that change. Um, yes. So um I'm publishing some of the videos that I did at the British Legal Technology Forum, um, which were a fast, so as I've mentioned, probably far too many times because I was really excited about it. We had this little media booth um, and uh, had a series of people throughout the day. To be honest with you, by the end of the day, the interviews, I think, get less coherent because we were on camera all day spontaneously, like people would just come in. But um, so, But the content is actually great. And so... And it's really fascinating because I gave a degree of autonomy to people to talk about what they wanted to talk about, which I thought, I mean, if there's something interesting, I would say, let's talk about that. But um, to to an extent, because they were quite spontaneous, I, I wanted people to have some say in what we talked about. And it's really fascinating, the different array of conversations. So um, we had um, Amir Mehdi, who is the global ex-global CIO of Barclays Bank. Um, and of all of the things that you might think he wanted to talk about, he wanted to talk about people. So we spent, and these were very short fire interviews. You've got all the noise and the hubbub of BLTF in the background, but he wanted to talk about the importance of people and the emphasis, particularly right now with all of the change that we're charting going on, um, <laughs> of, 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 of thinking about your team. Have you got the right people on your team have you are you recruiting the right people are you training them are you investing in them are you engaging with them you know he said that in all of the hubbub and excitement of of all of the you know change that's going on in our sector let's not forget the important stuff and we always talk about people process technology <laughs> people fast <laughs> he was saying are we really though and i thought it was it was kind of fascinating for me that doesn't surprise me because in the last few weeks, I've been talking about two different reports that I released. One is called The Change Makers, and another is uh, called uh, Legal Operations at a Crossroads. So talking, basically talking to legal operations folks, a group at law firms and a group in corporations. And when I asked the law firm leaders, and I spoke about this research at the ALA conference a couple weeks ago, and then it, I managed Connect Live uh, a, a week ago, the the number one challenge that they're facing is is talent. It isn't technology. So that resonates with me because it's consistent with a lot of my research that the issue is really – and it's not just hiring the right people. It's all of the dynamics associated with work that have changed since the pandemic, getting people together, persuading them that coming in is is worth it. How often should they come in? There's There's – no consistency, and it's a very interesting moment where we need to find the right people. We need to cultivate their talent. We need to apply their talent to all the things that are uh, evolving in our workplace, and then we need to figure out what where does the technology fit. It's a fascinating uh, moment, but I, I think I totally, I totally agree with uh, that point. Were they talking about not being able to get get the right? people in or for, for the, like the, in terms of the people who have got the right training they were talking about talent as a 
macro challenge, mm -hmm. which would incorporate finding them, keeping them, optimizing the work figuring out where they're best suited to do what and where technology can empower them rather than replace them. But the, the human element is a really, is a really big issue, right? The emotional component associated with deploying technology in ways that will eliminate certain tasks mm -hmm. that a human being used to accomplish is meaningful and something that the process needs to address before you just throw the technology into it. You need to give people a chance to feel comfortable with the tools that, and then almost themselves volunteer to apply the tool to something that they were doing so that they are sort of realizing that this is a benefit as opposed to a challenge. Yeah. So really taking them on that journey rather than f them feeling like you're inflicting something on them, which means that you're going to get better adoption. We've seen that with a ton of other things. This isn't new, right? Well, and to your point before about mm. trying to give people some meaningful takeaways as opposed to the usual, uh, I think that there was there was like a pattern and, a, and almost a checklist for people who are really – so what I tried to do was to try to characterize – what is a change maker? Like, what are the skills? What are the talents? What are the techniques of a change maker? And there were, you know, so there was sort of lots of planning and then more planning. There was lots of communicating and more communicating. There was lots of persistence because change makers tend to get, tend not to have a hundred percent success rate in terms of securing buy in. So they get rejected every so often. They're pretty good because they generate and earn trust. So if they come to someone with an idea, that idea is typically adopted because they've earned their trust and they know it's in the best interest of the organization, but they definitely get rejected. And so this idea of being persistent, uh, but the idea of planning, communicating, persistence, showing value, getting buy-in, you know, this sort of uh, required ROI is, uh, is the all critical components and things that people should make sure on their checklist of driving change they have and are, are uh, comfortable supporting and defending. On, on the flip side of the people coin, so so I've been to two, two things I think are quite interesting. I was speaking to somebody who um, has just selected someone in a law firm, an IT mm -hmm. director, who's just selected some new technology. Um, and it's Microsoft. So, so we were talking about it's it's mainstream. Um, and they were saying about the need. So, th so there's this big so demand on people that have sort of perhaps maybe more, um, you know, but have, have Gen AI skills. And there's also just a demand for people who are really good, because I think there's this sense that right now we're kind of at this, we are at a kind of quite critical juncture. So they want really good people. There's two things. One is this point about having mainstream tech. I think for law firms that have had um, technology that's perhaps just pure legal tech, you know, unless we can unless there's a big pool of them within our community it can be difficult to find people um and then the other thing is that we, we're seeing with people that have gen ai skills mm. um or ai skills they are in so much demand you know they are in so much demand that it's not even funny um so we um you know one particular story that i wrote which i have to say the number of impressions on linkedin hit nearly record numbers the only one that outdid it was um i manager's integration with copilot which kind of break broke broke my website um, but so this guy called sean curran who's the ex it he's not it director but he's like he is director of it and then his sort of the one a guy above him ollie bethel cto but anyway, so sean and four guys have moved created their own ai um company and I think that really speaks to Travis Smith and it's UK top 50, 60 firm, 50, um, has um, given it the green light. Um, they've gone to do their own thing, but it really speaks to the amount of demand, I think, um, for people who, you know, for good people. I think that sh they, they, those guys could have had, you know, pretty much their sort of pick you know like in terms of i think there's so much demand i think people oh people who have these skills have quite a lot of power right now and the money that that is being thrown at it is quite quite you know big and then obviously we're seeing these ai heads as well these kind of chief ai roles being created for the first time there's obviously your side of the pond Ari. 
um, not so much in the UK, but then the in the US, they, we, these you know chief AI officer um, roles are appearing. So it's kind of fascinating. Um, you know, the people thing is fascinating from a number of different perspectives. Yeah, and I also think you're seeing an an emphasis on balancing AI with all of the different infrastructure challenges associated with m making it successful, whether that's the the tools that people need or the training or time to just test it out and feel comfortable with it, the policies that need to be drafted, the comfort level and communication with clients about it. There's this, instead of just AI all the time, it's sort of AI within the confines of where it fits, which I think is a much more interesting and helpful and practical conversation. The shiny object moment seems to be passing, at least in legal, in favor of a thoughtful conversation about tactical use and avoiding pitfalls. I know that I'm the MC of the Lexable conference in Amsterdam next week. I'm super excited about it, honored to be returning and have spoken to almost all of the speakers. So if there are 26 or 27 speakers, I think I've, I've had conversations with 23 of them. And there are several programs, obviously, about AI, but it's not just about AI. It's about knowledge management. It's about technology. It's about process. And I think that Every time we have a conversation and I talk to the speakers about what they're going to present, they are experts. And as experts, they're not simply trying to tell people whether to use something or not use something. They'll try to explain where it works best and who it's best suited for. And I think that conversation tends to be very meaningful. I think we should name and shame the three that you haven't spoken to, Ari. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame myself. It's purely a schedule <laughs> issue. Uh, but but I will say that I would encourage people as another practical tip that a lot of events in some ways now have an app. And in the past, I don't think it was as easy to know who was coming to an event. But now a lot of events have an app. And I know Lexbo has an app. And you can see who's going to be there. And I encourage people to Lincoln, you know, set set the tone before you get there and say, hey, I look forward to seeing you. I'm, of course, going to be running because that's what I do. People that's think that's cool. my career, which it has yeah. become in some respect. And so I if I, if someone links in with me, I'll respond and say, hey, I hope that you'll run. There's going to be a group of us, even though I'm Is not so sure. Is that a spontaneous thing or have you got something on the app for your run? For Alexa? There, no, there's definitely something on the app. That but you can sign up to? At every, at every event now, I ask them to say that we'll be running. I did it at iManage and it was super fun. I had no idea even where we were going to, I mean, I knew obviously that morning, but when they asked me, I was trying to map out an area that would work and it, it really did. So uh, for this one, I know where we're going. Amsterdam would be so rich and jumpy. Amsterdam would be amazing for a run. It'd be so beautiful. It, yes, it, Amsterdam is beautiful. And yes, uh, I ran in the city of Amsterdam along one of the canals uh, with a partner, uh, a uh, at, a, at a law firm in the U.S. Uh, when when I was there once, and we had the best run. This is actually uh, the ho the venue is near the airport, but still, there's a so it won't be in the city, but there's a great run that runs to a lake. And a couple of years ago, we were at a different airport. I have a different hotel near the airport, and we also ran. And there was a windmill. We just happened to run to a windmill, which was such a classic uh, Dutch oh. experience, and it was amazing. So, and also, it isn't just that; it's much more the camaraderie, right? The conversation, yeah. the fun, the sort of getting I mean, lost. When you're running, no, this is why I don't run with you. Like the idea of having a conversation whilst running. <laughs> yes. Run yeah. Well, it depends. Fast. Depends on the pace, right? Do you it depend? <laughs> we we tend to run slowly uh, to enjoy the morning. I'm not. I'm not racing anybody. But anyway, aside from aside that. Aside from that. So the yes. other the other very brief thing that I did um in the past week in charting change uh was I spoke with. I like how you said that right into the micro in charting. <laughs> charting. Charting change is what we're doing here. <laughs> I spoke with um. Obviously, you're very much involved with the legal ops world. You're involved with lots of worlds, but you know, legal ops is one of your areas of speciality. You know, you write lots of reports. And I had a really interesting conversation with Stephanie Hamon, who runs the legal ops practice at Norton Rose. She set it up. 
Um, and we were talking about some trends um, in her practice and how she's working with in-house legal teams and, you know, what she's obser observing um, and how she's helping them. And we were talking about how, you know, the theme is very much, and this was a video, we'd, I've been doing a lot of videos, it's the old podcast stuff, um, which we, we were talking about how it's still very much a case of repurposing existing technology, right? So, or maybe... I don't, I don't think that's a new thing really but anyway but there's very much like you know case of obviously there's there always this pressure to do more with less I'm never sure if it's with or for less more with less more with less um so you know they a lot of legal ops teams are looking at how they can use that they're obviously a cost center we've talked about this for many years this is not changing um although some of them do have a generation element but anyway so they're doing more with the existing tech stack microsoft is featuring very highly in that um but obviously there's other technologies and it's how to repurpose that so that you may not be able to get a hundred percent of the functionality that you want to be frank um i like these frank conversations but maybe you can get to 80 percent, right and you can you can start to be smart in the way that you're using um the existing technology um so it's a really interesting conversation and i'm sure that that's a theme that comes up time and time again in your research well, it actually that I asked that exact question, what's optimal use of your technology stack in a law firm? So when I spoke to uh, the leaders in law firms, I was really focusing on the midsize area. And I asked specifically, what's optimal usage of your technology stack? And 80% was sort of around there. You know, there are people who said, obviously, we'd love to 100, but our challenges are twofold. People are not trained to use 100% of our, the applications that we have, which is more a function of time than than intent, right? The firm will offer the training, but people need to make time for it. And the other one was awareness. They don't even know we have this tool or that the tool can do something. So on a law firm side, that's the case. And it's totally true what you were just talking about in, in legal departments, because in this other report, I spoke to 90% of the people I spoke to were the director of the department. And one of the most interesting elements of the evolution of the legal operations role is that it's increasingly becoming an enterprise-wide resource. So even though the role is meant to serve legal, because they are savvy at doing more for less, because they are familiar with a much more, I'd like a broad range of tools and have a holistic tech stack where they can use pieces of one on a plan for another, they're getting requests from other groups who are asking them, how do you do that? Can we can we tap into your this or can we can you help us try that? And so yes, they are reusing the idea of reusing technology is almost an extension of reusing data. You know, it was sort of if I've coded something in any discovery matter a year ago, I already know what that code is. Why can't I reuse that? So there's always been this intent to take advantage of work that we've already done for efficiency's sake. And so it's it's interesting to hear those perspectives because they they really ring true that's fascinating and then so yeah because with with say for example contract life cycle management tools. great example right so, yeah so obviously legal ops that would probably be their project right probably maybe not always but um i guess it might be the, the finance director i don't know anyway i don't that'd be interesting to come uh, up to, one but... of the questions i ask is always who owns contracts yeah. or who should own contracts and it always and in my research whenever i'm i'm all it's all qualitative so these are interviews and i always put in brackets like laughter sigh because you know you do a lot of interviewing like i do like it's interesting how much you can learn from the unspoken moments and so the idea of who should own it is increasingly sort of controversial is maybe too strong a word, but a a source of contention, like what who, legal should be part of it, but actually maybe it's procurement, maybe the business unit should own the commercial side of these agreements, and it goes on and on. And so there's obviously legal is owning the mechanism, right? The CLM tool is typically a, a legal ops function. I feel like it's settled there, but whether legal is the actual owner of the contract or the contracting process, legal obviously needs some oversight, but the business knows the terms and legal wants to make sure they have parameters in which they can operate freely, but not without 
any constraints. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma in an organization. I wonder, I wonder exactly right back if it comes down to the person and how capable, like you were saying, you know, that they're gaining recognition perhaps from the rest of the business. That's really fascinating. I guess if you've got a really great legal ops person who's quite a strong personality, who's really good and who people have confidence in, you know, that, that I, sometimes I think it comes down to that. Like I had a conversation about CIOs recently and, you know, there's this sort of legacy perception that they they didn't have this seat at the table. I, I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, history and um, certain certain amount of personality associated with people who are good at tech. And I'm probably going to get absolutely killed for saying that. But there is a certain, you know, and it's like about, about expectation. Do I deserve a seat at the table? And am I the right person for this job? And I and I do think a lot of it comes down to personality and and almost expectation. I know that's a really simplistic way of looking at it, but but actually, if you were saying you know that people are coming to the legal ops people and saying you know how do you do this, then certainly if you've got a strong, very good legal ops person who perhaps owns the contract lifecycle management project, that taps in as you know the whole point is to to have you know to enable the business right, and so actually that that is quite interesting in terms of the power that that would give that person because they would potentially be then plugged into all different parts of the business. Well, it's also logical. If you were to look at sort of the arc of development, let's say e-discovery was at a foundational level and then all the legal ops folks became much more familiar with it because it's often one of the largest areas of spend. And so then they learned how to be savvy with it, which technology is available, which which providers, which technology providers and service providers were the ones that could support it. And then as CLM emerged, they became also sophisticated, but you had these other individuals who, because they had this foundational experience of managing budgets and managing data, could better support these services. And now you have AI, uh, and particularly generative AI. Uh, and so I think that if, if you were to imagine like steps rising or something that they're, they've built on each foundational level to get to the next one. And so the legal operations person has been there. And in fact, also, it, I think there's an interesting development, which came up in my e-discovery unfiltered report of providers going from one area to another. So an e-discovery provider supporting contract lifecycle management, now supporting AI implementation or policy making or uh, other areas in terms of being the liaison between the client and the and the law firm, for example. So wonderful moment, I think, of, of collaboration between all the different constituencies in legal. It was quite funny because when he went, he had e-discovery, then contract lifecycle management, then AI. It's like, and that so AI is just taking it over. Now it's down to AI. <laughs> well, we, you know, the e-discovery folks, the whole thing. I think the e-discovery folks, that's right. I think the e-discovery folks take issue with calling AI like an emerging tool because it's been, it's been an accepted part of e-discovery for a decade and more and there's tremendous expertise in that area uh, so it's not really new it's just this component of generating something with you know using ai and there's a lot of distinction there but i'm i'm actually doing a webinar today talking about the use of ai in communication and advocacy so i'm excited to kind of explore this i really have feel lucky and i know you do too just to be part of the conversations and to hear what people are saying and also to kind of track the trajectory of those conversations. It just seems like a lot more familiarity and people recognize that you can't just be throwing around words or phrases anymore. You have to have some substance behind it. You don't need to have the answer to every nuance, but you really need to be familiar enough because people are smart enough to ask the right questions and are relying on professionals in our field to have – at least sufficient answers that allow them to take the next step. Yeah. When you say track the trajectory, do you not mean chart change? And I think that's uh, probably where, <laughs> I think that's probably where we need to wrap up, Ari. <laughs> and there we are. Our new, the name of our new show is going to be tra tracking the trajectory. <laughs> Why did we not come up with that? That's oh so man. Funny. Alliteration is my thing. <laughs> Darn doofus. Anyway. Ari, as usual, it's a pleasure. Caroline, my honor. I hope you have a great weekend. You too.